Now, this passage which we began to look at last time, um, this passage is famous for the fruit of the Spirit, which come in verses 22 and 23. But as you picked up from my prayer, we're not looking at that this evening. We're we're looking at what comes first. Before we get to the fruit of the Spirit that's mentioned in those verses, we have, verses 19 to 21, the works of the flesh. So that's our focus this evening. Last time, as we looked at this little block of Galatians 5, we saw how the flesh and the Spirit are opposed to one another. Those who are believers have the Spirit of God in them powerfully at work. Nonetheless, they also have the flesh still, while we're still in these bodies until our mortal bodies finally uh, stop and perish and, 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 and then get raised, ultimately get raised gloriously. Uh, and so we will not always have the flesh, this sinful nature that Paul refers to as the flesh. But nonetheless, in this life we will. And so we saw last time how these two forces are opposed within us. And so a, really a believer is a battleground in this life. And so this week what we're looking at are the works of the flesh which are enumerated for us uh, in those verses. And we can see that those verses are not an exhaustive list because it ends, verse, middle of verse 21, uh, they, uh, what does it say? and things like these. So you get to the end of the list, lists a certain number of things, and then things like these. These are this is not an exhaustive list. You'll find another list in Mark chapter 7, um, verse 22 or thereabouts. Um, works of, of the evil things that our, our fallen human nature produces, the sort of deeds that uh, produced, uh, produced in us. So we're looking at this, evening, this, this subject, and you might think this is not quite what I came for this evening. Well, I hope it's a blessing for you even so, as we look at this subject of the works of the flesh and our need to crucify them. That's our subject this evening. And the, the works of the flesh and the need to crucify them. Now, it's not in itself edifying, helpful, to look at closely at specific sins. But it is worth doing so if we consider them from the point of view of the signature desires and deeds that they are of the person who is not heading for glory. That's what we have. That's actually the context in which the works of the flesh come in our passage. Uh, we see them here as mentioned as, as markers of those who are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And so it's worth, from that point of view, uh, considering them. That, I think, will be helpful. That will be edifying for us right, to consider these different works of the flesh. In other words, if we see these markers in our own lives, then alarm bells ought to be going off. That's the sort of idea we're thinking at this evening. So then, the works of the flesh and the need to crucify them. And my way into this this evening is I want to begin with the very serious warning that comes in verse 21, second half of verse 21. I warn you, says the Apostle Paul, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things, such things as these works of the flesh listed just before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now this warning then that comes in verse 21 is relevant to us all. Because as I say, we all still live in our flesh. We all still have this sinful nature. All of us, you, me, uh, believer, non-believer, we still have a sinful nature. If we're a believer, we have an overpowering uh, force, the, the Holy Spirit, who's not a force, who's a person, but he's nonetheless a power in us. We still have a sinful nature in this life. And so the warning is relevant to us all. Because the sinful nature naturally produces the works that are listed in verses 19 to 21. And those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We each have a wellspring in us then that produces markers of destruction. Markers of those who will not be saved. Now that's, in other words, a serious thing. It's something for us to seriously Take, uh, take into consideration. We all want to inherit the kingdom of God, don't we? Um, and we, we hear that sort of phrase about inheriting the kingdom in the, the words of Jesus in Matthew 25, um, verse 34, where Jesus has the, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats. This is a picture of the final judgment. And those on his right who are saved 
To them he says this, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom. The same words as Paul uses here, inheriting the kingdom of God. Inherit the kingdom, says Jesus, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's what we each want to hear, isn't it? That's what we want to hear as we come to judgment day and stand before his awesome throne. And as we die and uh, before judgment day and go and stand before our Lord, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, not depart from me. And so we need to take this seriously. We cannot produce the, work, the works of the flesh, which we'll look at very shortly. We cannot produce them and think we're heading for glory. That's the point. So we need to take this seriously then. So what's the answer then? Well, the answer is verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified. More literally, those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So this refers to our conversion but more than that refers to the ongoing putting to death of these deeds, these things, these attitudes that will keep coming up, keep arising from within us. And we can see that from parallel verse, a very similar verse anyway in Romans chapter 8 verse 13, which talks about putting to death regularly, continually, putting to death the deeds of the body. So we need then to crucify the flesh. What does that mean? What does it mean to crucify the flesh? without which it says we don't even belong to Christ. If we don't do this, if we're not doing this, we don't even belong to Christ. So what does it mean then to crucify the flesh? Well, it means to hate, turn from, renounce the sinfulness of our sinful nature. To hate it, to, to desire to be rid of it. It means earnestly desiring its destruction. Well, how can we do that? How, how can we crucify our sinful nature? And the clue is in the word crucify, because that's a, surely a loaded term for anyone who knows their New Testament. It's a very loaded term, isn't it? It's through the one who was crucified that we will crucify our sinful nature, without which we don't even belong to Christ. It's through Christ crucified. And we can see that from the way that Paul describes his own experience in chapter 2, verse 19 of Galatians, as being crucified with Christ. Chapter 2, verse 19. It's verse 20, sorry. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul saw his own conversion as a crucifixion. And not just crucifixion, that, uh, not, obviously not a literal crucifixion, but nonetheless a real crucifixion. And it's a crucifixion with Christ, crucified with Christ. So that as Jesus is literally crucified, then that power is applied to Paul's own heart. And he gets crucified with Christ. And a whole new Paul arises, having been crucified with Christ. So this expression, crucified with Christ, it's a powerful phrase which describes, or maybe better, denotes Christian repentance. Now some of you here this evening, some of you, if you're watching online, some of you may never have sought, about, um, never have sought anything about you to be crucified in any sense. And so if that's the case, my prayer is that what we do now as we look at these works of the flesh will cause you to desire these things that you see in yourself to be crucified and the only way they can be crucified and you be made new is by the Lord Jesus Christ who was crucified and who was resurrected. So I'm going to go through now the works of the flesh in verses 19 to 21 and as I do that see if you can recognize any of these things in yourself and same for me in myself as, a, as though, uh, can you see these things alive and well in you, alive and uncrucified in you? In which case, there are things that we need to do. In which case, we need to heed the warning of verse 21 about not inheriting the kingdom of God. And so we need to, if we see these things, plead with God that we be 
crucified wholly with Christ if we'd never ever come to him for that. And if we have, and see things that still need to be changed, still need to be crucified and put right, and we come to him for those things. So may this be helpful for believers and non-believers. For believers in highlighting the specific areas, for non-believers in just seeing your whole need to be crucified with Christ and made new from the ground up. Let's begin then. We're going to look at in five different blocks of these works of the flesh. First of all, the verse 19b, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. There's a big overlap between those three things. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Now this obviously includes the deeds of the body, sex outside of marriage, and nowadays you have to say marriage as heterosexual marriage because that's God's definition of marriage. So anything outside of that is obviously a work of the flesh. And if you're doing those things uncrucified, then you, are, uh, you have all the marks of someone who is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Certainly not in the way you're living currently. But also, we know from Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount that it's not just what we do physically, but what we do with our eyes and our minds as well. So turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. It's on page 810. Matthew 5, 27 and 28. And in this whole block of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is taking Old Testament commands, commands from the um, Ten Commandments, and saying, well, no, the bar's higher than that. He's raising the bar. He's saying, no, not just that, but this. It's not just what you physically do, it's what you do in your mind as well. So, uh, Matthew 5, 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. That's indeed the seventh commandment, Exodus chapter 20. But I say to you, says Jesus, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, we live in a world that is set up for this. Our roads are being dug up for this. You might think, how do you say that, David? I used to work in the industry. I used to work in the mobile phone industry. And I distinctly remember a Nokia, senior Nokia executive standing in front of our company, telling us what the video on the phones was going to be used for. It's all about sex, he said, quite openly. We live in a society where that's set up for this thing that Jesus is talking about here. Set up for sexual immorality with our eyes and minds. We've got vast infrastructures being upgraded as we speak to make this possible. And it's not just pornography. It's, it's uh, what we might not class as pornography, but the Lord is still not pleased about as well. There's so much entertainment where there's uh, things portrayed before us uh, that is begging the viewer to do Matthew 5.27 and lust with their eyes. It's a bit like Canaan. You know, the, the Israelites went into Canaan. It was a land set up by the Canaanites for sin, set up for idolatry. We live in an equivalent to that set up for this particular sin, sexual immorality, and particularly with our minds and our eyes. Now we need to be wise to this, and that's why I read that passage of Genesis 39, um, uh, uh, Joseph. Jesus quite often says about being watchful. Being watchful. And I used to puzzle, like, what does that mean? It means be in your guard. That's exactly what Joseph was. Joseph was on his guard against this very thing. And we need to be the same. Because just walk around this world and it'll be thrown at us all the time, this particular sin. Look here, lust here, that sort of idea. And so let me ask you, let me ask myself, is this sin uncrucified in your life? If so, seek its crucifixion in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has the power to do this. And if any of you are entrapped 
in this particular sin, and I know that many, many are, including in the churches across the West. Jesus Christ has the power to break the hold of this sin over your life. He does. He has the power to break this sin. Even with all the infrastructure set up to cause us, to draw us to do it, he has the power to break this sin over us. So don't despair. Come to Christ. He will crucify this for you if you seek it from him. Secondly, our second uh, set of, well, sins, just, just a single one actually, verse 20, idolatry. Idolatry. Now I've been thinking about this one the, over the last few days, and I know for some this is an issue. God is the living God, the only God. And he will not be placed alongside other gods as though he's one option on a menu of gods. And I just want to show you this briefly from Isaiah. Isaiah is brilliant on this. Uh, let me just, let's just look at a few passages of Isaiah just briefly on this. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 18 to 26. And listen to how God does not want to be compared or placed alongside other gods. Isaiah 40, verse 18, it's on page 600. Sorry, I forgot to say the page number. Page 600. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in, and who brings princes to naught and who makes the rulers of this, uh, the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely is their stem taken root in the ground, when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and on high and see who created all these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. He's thinking of the stars. Who created all these? He who brings them out by host, uh, out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Now flick over to chapter 46 of Isaiah, and we'll read verses 5 to 7. I would recommend actually you read Isaiah 46 later. Just have a read of this chapter and see the, the contrast between idols that have to be carried and the Lord who carries. There's a real powerful contrast here. And Isaiah's got in mind Babylonian uh, processions of, of these idols that had to be borne up on chariots and that sort of thing. We'll read verses 5 to 7 though. Hear this same theme coming back. Um, Isaiah 46 verse 5, page 607. To whom then will you liken me and make me equal, says the Lord? And compare me that we may be alike. Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales, hire a goldsmith and make it into, an, into a god. Then they fall down and worship. They lift it to their shoulders and they carry it. They set it in its place and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. Now that's the key thing. Idols cannot do anything. They're useless. They're nothings. They're emptiness. And God refuses to be placed alongside them as though he's one of them when he's the God who created the heavens and the earth. He's spread out the heavens like a canopy and so on. God then, the real God, has real power. Real power. And all the other alternative gods are nothing. They cannot save. And so if you're involved in idolatrous things that set the living God besides other gods, small g, then do you hear what our passage says? It says this needs crucifying. 
This needs ending. This cannot continue. And you inherit the kingdom of God. Next one then from back in Genesis, uh, sorry, Galatians chapter 5. Sorcery. Sorcery. Now this would include all interest in the occult, the paranormal. I confess when I was a boy I was interested in paranormal books. I used to get them from the library shelves. That was not a good thing to do. And just as I was preparing this, that came to mind. It includes things like Ouija boards. Everything from that to horoscopes and horror movies. It includes contacting the dead, supposedly, as spiritualists think they do, though they don't. They just dabble with demons. It includes consulting shamans. And I mention that because I recently heard of someone dabbling in that. It's very, very dangerous. It includes New Age practices. Tarot cards, angel cards, and similar things like that. We have some great testimonies in our church of people who've been saved out of these backgrounds, who crucified these things, came to Christ and crucified these things. And if these are any things that you're involved in, then you need to crucify them as well. And if you're involved in similar things, or you're not sure if they're similar things, then do come and talk to me and ask me, and I'll try and find out if, and, and look into them and if, if you're involved in things you're not sure if they're good or not. There's that great passage in Acts. I probably don't have time to read it. Now. Acts 19, verse 18 to 20. The, the, the converted Ephesians there, they, they make a great bonfire of their former magic and witchcraft and all those sorts of things. They, they burn them. They, they very visibly crucify that old life. And that's what we need to do if you're involved in anything like that. There's a great testimony on, uh, on David Kay's um, Exposit the Word channel, Doing Virtue. I do recommend you, you listen to that. Uh, it, it's somebody who's been saved out of that background, out of what we might call the, the milder end of this sort of stuff. You know, they're not the sort of hardcore witchcraft sort of thing, but what we might call the, the more um, uh, socially acceptable sort of end of, of, of these things. And she was saved out of that and, and just wants to totally renounce and crucify all of that old life. It's, it's a great interview. I uh, thoroughly recommend it. What are we up to now? Fourthly, I think now, fourthly. Uh, this is most of the rest of them in Galatians 5 again. Oh, I lost my place, Galatians. Uh, so here we're looking at everything after sorcery, apart from the last two. Enmity, strife, Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. So these are all the things, don't forget, these are things that are markers of those who are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Let me read them again. Enmity, that's hostility. Strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. Now there's overlap between those. I'm sure you can hear that. They're not all totally overlapping. They're not all identical, certainly. Now, this is certainly, the, talking of socially acceptable, this is perhaps the socially acceptable face of the works of the flesh. You might think, well, I'd, I'd never be involved in, in those occult things. I'd never be involved in those idolatrous things. But perhaps we easily are involved in these sorts of things. Fits of anger. Envy. Jealousy, those sorts of things. It's easy to see these things as though they're not that serious, isn't it? And, and we can think that they're on a different level, but Paul lists them in the same list as, as the others, doesn't he? And so we need to see these. These are also patterns of behavior that mark those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are interpersonal sins, aren't they? So God cares not just about our vertical godliness. He cares about that very much. He also cares about our one anothering, how we treat one another. Bitterness and grudges and divisions and all these things are serious in his sight and need to be crucified. Now, we might, it might be worth just stating a caveat here about divisions. Divisions, which is one of the things mentioned there. There are times when refusal to show unity with others who profess to be Christians 
There are times when refusal to show unity with others in that situation is right and necessary if there are gospel issues at stake. If there are gospel issues that are being denied. So, for example, we cannot truly, properly, rightly unite with those who accept same-sex marriage any more than Paul could unite with the Judaizers who were troubling the Galatian churches. He wouldn't do that. We shouldn't do that either. That's clear. And so there are limitation there are um, qualifications to this uh, particular thing about divisions but we shouldn't give that caveat the last word on this we need to come back and hear the force of it again because it's it may have challenges for you at least one of those things in that list has challenges for me enmity strife jealousy fits of anger rivalries dissensions divisions envy does anything in that list look uncrucified in your life if so, you need to come to Christ and crucify those things. Let's look at the last two, drunk, drunkenness and orgies. Now, these may seem obvious, but it needs to be said. Because, again, there are those who profess to follow Christ that do these things sometimes. That's tragic. Now, alcohol is not forbidden by the Scriptures. We can think of many examples of this, not least the wine that Jesus made from water at that wedding in Cana in Galilee in John chapter 2. So alcohol is not forbidden by the scriptures, but drunkenness certainly is. We see that in a number of places, including here. And more than drunkenness, we also have orgies. Well, orgies will include drunkenness, but it will also include uh, sexual liaisons in partying, that sort of thing. Now the party scene is I think particularly big for teenagers. And so I urge youngsters listening, here or online, just to listen to this passage urging you to crucify these things if you, to, if you desire to inherit the kingdom of God. Clubbing as well, that's another scene where these things take place. Drinking, sexual liaisons. Don't think that you can live like that and just inherit the kingdom of God as well. Now, it's not just youngsters. People of any age can easily party to excess, and maybe more than some of us are guilty of that at Christmas. Don't let these things go uncrucified, is the message of our passage. Well, as I begin to wrap up, have any of these things we've looked at given you a pang, made you think, ouch, I need to think about that. I need to, I need to address that. I'll just give you a moment or two just to gather any thoughts of maybe more than one thing that's, that's come up. Certainly for me, there's more than one thing that's come up here that I need to think about and make sure that I, I deal with carefully. So I'll just, I'll just give you a moment just to think. Maybe just read that list again, verses 19 to 21. As I conclude, hold those things in your mind still. As I conclude, I want to do so with the gospel. Okay, I'm not preaching moralism here. That would be a total disaster. If, if you just, it was go home and try harder, folks. That would not be being a faithful preacher of the gospel. I've got to preach the gospel, and I want to do that. And the gospel is here, and it's here, verse 24, in the words, crucify. We thought about, about it already. Let's just think about it again. We need to let that word crucify in verse 24 have its full connotations, its full biblical connotations, okay? Because Paul surely chooses that word to point us to Christ and to him crucified. That's how we're going to deal with these things. Otherwise, it's, it's not a matter of making us feel bad about these things and then saying, well, just go and pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps. That, that's, a, that, that's, that's never going to happen. That's never going to work. That's disastrous. That's not the gospel. If there are things in that list of works of the flesh that you know that you need to deal with, that you need to be rid of if you are to inherit the kingdom of God, then Christ has been crucified and there's the power that you need. 
There's the power that you need. It's utterly um, counterintuitive to the world's eyes that there could be power there in, in, in a crucified man on a cross, but that's where it is. That's where the gospel directs us. And Jesus died powerfully, not just to wash us of the guilt and punishment of our sin. He certainly did that. And also to cleanse us of the defiling presence of sin in our hearts and lives, to make us like Christ, to make us like him. And so as we think about these things that we've had in our minds, then come to Christ by faith and plead to have your flesh, your sinful nature, crucified with him. And if there are people who've never, ever looked to Christ to have anything about them crucified, well, you need to have everything about you crucified. You need to come to Christ and have your whole being crucified with him and made new, brought to death and made alive again, a new life in Christ. And so whether believer or unbeliever, whether it's believer who's never come to Christ, believers who have but need to be challenged and stirred and exercised by some of the things mentioned here, will come to Christ, all of us, and openly lay our need and our, our sinfulness and our flesh and our sinful nature before him and plead with him to have these things crucified. Here is power and grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, may the Spirit apply the healing power of Christ's wounds, counterintuitive though it is. May he do that. May the Holy Spirit do that in all of our lives so that we do what this passage is urging us to do, which is to inherit the kingdom of God. Let's pray together.